I'm about to pour cold water on the prospect raised two years ago that there's some kind of alien megastructure orbiting an otherwise dull star about a thousand light years from us. Giant solar panels, perhaps, generating electricity for a remote, spectacularly advanced society. The story starts and continues with amateur volunteers, first scanning data from the planet-hunting space telescope Kepler, and now funding and performing follow-up observations to work out just what is out there. Kepler spots planets by the way they momentarily block light from distant stars, much as a fly passing a lamp will temporarily cast a tiny shadow. Louisiana State University's Tabi Boyajin has the honour of leading research on this star and being immortalised in its name. This star that you mentioned is KIC 8462852. That's its catalogue name. It's now been known as Tabby's star since I was the one who first led the discovery paper. Which do you prefer? Oh, I don't care. I call it WTF. <laughs> Meaning? It stands for where's the flux, where flux means brightness. And that's the point is that its flux, its brightness was changing in completely bizarre ways. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It had these very unique patterns in its brightness variations where for most of the time it was a constant brightness. But then every once in a while in a non-predictable manner, it would drop in its brightness from, you know, a couple percent down to over 20 percent. Over 20 percent. I mean, this is a technique which Kepler was using in any case to look for planets because you get a slight dip in the brightness of a star as a planet blots a little bit of it out on its orbit. But that's a regular process. Yeah, that's correct. That's called the transit method. And it's been extremely successful in finding planets. Kepler has found thousands of planets in this manner. So you got these data in from these amateur astronomers who are scanning the Kepler results. And they said, look, this is something that's behaving completely weirdly. And you said, where's the flux? <laughs> Effectively, yes. <laughs> I mean, it really leapt out at you, did it? Or did you just think there was something wrong with the data? That is actually everyone's reaction at first. Every astronomer I've ever talked to says, oh, well, no, stars don't do that. There's something wrong with the data. But we checked it in many, many different ways, and it all checked out to be good. So it had to be, you know, something astrophysical that was causing it, not something wrong with the data. And of course, we all got to know about this because the sexy solution is that there's some kind of alien megastructure that's somehow randomly turning around this star and blotting it out from time to time. Yes, that's right. The alien megastructure star. You sound very distasteful about that hypothesis. No, no. It was one of the many bad ideas that we had to explain that what was going on. But, you know, we went through a whole long list of natural explanations and none of them really worked very well. And so a colleague of mine suggested that it would be an interesting target for SETI, which is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, because we did not have a natural explanation for it. And of course, the rest of us all got interested at this point. The point of your new paper is that you've actually taken a whole battery of telescopes to do quite long term observations of the star. Yes, that's correct. This program started a couple of years ago where we realized that at this point to learn anything more about the star, we needed to get more data on it. And since the brightness variations that we saw with Kepler weren't periodic, so we couldn't predict when the next one would come, then we had to watch it pretty much at all times. And so we can catch it doing something again. And so we started a long-term monitoring project to collect data and wait for something to happen. And in May of 2017, that something started to happen. We caught it dipping again, and it wasn't bad data from the Kepler Space Telescope. I mean, was this something that you saw, or there were people helping you to see this? This was observed by several observatories, and then we set out an alert, and the response from the community both professional and amateurs, was overwhelming. And we had dozens of observatories at this point taking a look at this star to try and see what we can learn from it. And you've actually seen not just that one, but you've seen several dipping events just in 2017. Yeah, that's right. So the first one we named Elsie. That was followed by three more, about the 1% to 2% level, so that they dropped in brightness from 1% to 2%. And how long were these dipping episodes? They lasted from several days to several weeks, actually. So if it's a several weeks one, that would have to be something moving very slowly 
in front of the star? Something that lasts several days could be something that's moving faster or would it just be something that's smaller? How does that work? Well, it could be something that's moving very slowly, but it could also be something that is very, very large. And this is really significant because we're able to get color information this time. So we're not, we're not just measuring the brightness in a single color like the Kepler mission did. If you take these brightness measurements in different colors, you can actually get an idea of what kind of material is passing in between you and the star. And if you have a planet going in front of a star, you would have the star's light in the blue and in the red blocked equally. What we actually observed was that the blue light got blocked more than the red light. And this signal indicates that whatever is passing in front of the star is not solid like a planet or an alien megastructure, but perhaps it's due to some sort of dust, so ordinary dust. It sounds to me like you have still quite a mystery to solve as to what's creating this dust that sometimes blots the star out and other times doesn't. Yes, that's very true. We still have a lot of work to do before we can actually explain all the data that we have. We do have a lot more data that we're currently working through, and so there'll be a few more papers that come out in the next few months. And we're also continuing this effort to monitor the star. We want to catch one of those big 20% dips like we saw with Kepler. If we catch a really, really big one, that will give us a lot more handle on, you know, what is passing in front of the star and blocking out the light. The mystery lives on and Tabby Boyajin remains on the case.